Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we commit and command the rest of our service time to you. We thank you for the worship we have enjoyed and how we have uh, looked to Christ as our all-sufficient Savior. We have recognized him as the one who makes us right before you, whose sacrifice on Calvary's cross has made us fit and meet for the kingdom. Bless uh, this preaching portion, worship portion of our time together. Help us to find uh, application for our lives that we might indeed continue to grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with the Kemp family as they are uh, preparing for the service even now and uh, the McCartney family tomorrow uh, for, for thir Tuesday's event. Uh, for the those who will be ordained in short order, we lift them up to you. We thank you that you've set aside men to manage your church. We pray that you would give them gifts and abilities that they may be sufficient to that task, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, amen. Well, as you, though most of you would know, on Wednesday past, I... Uh, said that we would try to have our mix and mingle time this coming Wednesday at the movie theater watching Courageous. When I made an attempt to do that, we had been beaten to the punch by another church uh, who was reserved next Wednesday. Um, I didn't want to pull rank on anybody. <laughs> Sorely tempted. I said, like, who, who is this person? They've come to the show as much as, as my people? No, oh, man, you all need to move them. But I, I, I didn't, I didn't. And so I had to uh, fetch around in my mind for another time. And um, it looks like Monday, tomorrow, is going to be our best time. And so tomorrow at 7, we have reserved that time. And um, you will need to be there by 6.30. It starts at 7. We want to make sure that our people are secure in getting their seats because other people will see that it's on and attempt to get in. Well, we don't want to make sure that they got your seat. And so I want to make sure that you're there, you're there by 6.30. I guess some of us can meet here and drive there together, or you can just meet there. Lots of parking space there. But you want to see Courageous. It's, it's powerful. It's a, a wonderful Christian movie put on by the same people that did Fireproof. And um, the movie is phenomenal. Uh, it had all the men in the church shedding tears, some um, trying to hold back. But uh, every so often, the light in the theater, you saw some moisture on somebody's cheek. So, you know, it was, it was a hard job trying to hide your tears. And so, lady, if you know the man, you have the man shedding tears, you can imagine. But the message is a powerful one, and it's one we need to hear. Yeah. Um, once again, the time is 7 p.m. We need you to be there by 6.30. I have not... Um, uh, you need to bring your $7.00. You need to bring your seven dollars. The, the elders, the leadership, may decide to give some kind of discount, if not the whole thing. But I've not spoken to them yet, and I'm not man enough to to make a financial decision from the pulpit, because I might have to dig into my uh, anniversary money, <laughs> or just talk to my friend Obi over here. You know, Obi got long dollars. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, leadership will make that decision. Come bringing your $7 anyway. You may be able to turn that into popcorn money. I don't know. But the leadership will uh, determine if we'll, if we'll take the whole, uh, the whole sponsorship of that. But I can make that decision from here. And I didn't have an opportunity to process that with them. So you'll appreciate my caution in uh, not being able to give you a straight answer on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alexio Roll, better known as Lex, you can uh, put up the... The slides for me, please. Grace, our emphasis on discipleship is bearing much fruit as our people are taking advantage of opportunities to grow in their knowledge of God. Rudolf Cartwright has been doing an excellent job teaching from the book of Ephesians, and Elder Andy Knowles has been teaching members how to witness and share their faith. Our Wednesday evening services have gotten off to a great start. You're seeing various videos of our elders groupings and um, uh, the, the elders leading them in some careful, carefully chosen uh, subjects that bring out the things we've been learning about together. Now, now Grace, 
when the leadership calls you to a heightened aspect of discipleship, we, we expect every hand on deck. And um, so we really need you, if you have not already indebted yourself to something on Wednesday evening, to make this, uh, make this a, a time in your life where you are getting a, a full diet, a full course of uh, encouragement to be more committed in your discipleship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are just some of the images, if you were out on Wednesday, which you should have been, uh, you would have seen and be a part of. Now, some of the groups were pretty filled, and some were kind of scanty. I want to encourage my elders with scanty groups, make sure you're calling your people, make sure they can tell you why they are out, why they're not out, and um, uh, what's what. And so, uh, it's just a, an appreciation for you to uh, see how the groups have been functioning, meeting all over the church. And in fact, let, let it keep on going, because we even have some classes for the young children to do their homework together, as well as a nursery and a class for the younger kids who are above nursery and not quite in high school. And of course, they were they were doing some structured teaching time, all courtesy of King's Court that has agreed to help us out in that regard. All right, you'll see those images in just a minute. But brothers and sisters, Brother Rudolph's class has helped us to learn how God has chosen us from the creation of the world and predestined us to be adopted into his family. That class has learned how Jesus has redeemed us from slavery to sin and an empty life. They've seen how the Holy Spirit in our lives is a guarantee of our spiritual inheritance. And they've seen how God fills our lives with his resurrection power. You need to be a part of this class as they study together the book of Ephesians. Friends, before we were invited into a relationship with Christ, we were spiritually dead. One, excuse me, spiritually dead. Two, dominated by demonic forces. And three, doomed. Paul says we were indeed children of wrath, headed for eternal destruction. But Christ saved us, redeemed us. Once like a bird in prison, he has freed us and taken us out of there and given us a new life. Well, if we have a new life in Christ, that should certainly show up in our behavior and the way we look, the way we act, the way we conduct ourselves. If our behavior is to match our belief, then we must be different. So different that the world notices us. How are we to be different? This passage from Ephesians 4:17 to 5:21, which will be just some basic reading with commentary, will help us. And again, it's to help us to understand the benefit we can have from being a part of the um, class currently going on with Elder Rudolph Cartwright from the book of Ephesians, as well as we can be mightily helped in our ability to witness and evangelize with the, el with the elders class being run by um, Elder Andy Knowles on how to give away your faith. Here's what Ephesians 4.17 says. Paul speaking says, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord. In other words, the Lord is behind me in saying this. That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walked. In the futility of their mind and thinking. Being darkened in their understanding. Excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the hardness of their heart. And they became callous. Having given themselves over to sensuality. For the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. Paul paints an awful picture of the non-Christian's thinking, his futility, his hardness of heart, his ignorance in spiritual things, and he says we ought not to be that way. Uh, notice the Greek or the Gentile's walk. He operates from the futility of his mind. His understanding is darkened. He is excluded from the life of God because of ignorance caused by the hardening of his heart against God. This is created in the man uh, the non-Christian, a callousness that has led them to be overcome by sensuality, impurity, and greediness. Paul goes on, verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new self. Lay aside the old self, be renewed in your mind, put on the new self. Three actions are being called for to help us as we grow in our discipleship. 
and put on the new self, which is which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul introduces things that the believer needs to put on and put off if he is to be successful in his Christian walk. Put off the old self which is being corrupted by deceitful lies, lay aside falsehood, put on the new self, created in righteousness and holiness. Verse 25, therefore laying aside falsehood, believers are called to lay aside anything that is false, anything that is deceitful, anything that is wrong. Lay it aside. We walk differently than the Gentile does. We walk differently. We speak differently. We are not as we were in times past. We lay aside these things. We put them aside. Lay aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. We belong to one another. I'm sure none of us go, along, go around practicing lying to our spouse, lying to our children, wanting our children to lie to us. They are members of one family. So the church is member with each other. Truth is our conversation. Falsehood belongs to our former father, the devil, who encouraged deceit and lies as a way of life. Paul introduces actions to begin practicing right away. Speaking of truth, be angry but don't sin with it. Don't use it as an excuse to sin, bruise, and destroy. He says in verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. I so appreciate finding out as a Christian that what I had originally been taught was not true, that Christians cannot be angry. The Bible never says as Christians we can't be angry. You ought to be angry as Christians. You ought to be angry at sin. You ought to be angry at a world that, that, that seeks to uh, crush the widow and the orphan, the disenfranchised. You ought to be angry at a world where lawlessness reigns supreme. You ought to be angry, and in your anger, do something about it. No, you know, we were taught a, a pablum Christianity. You're just supposed to go around milk toast and not let anything bother you and, and not be concerned about anything and just kind of wait for your blessing. No, 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 no. We've been called to be salt and light, to battle courageously against wrong and evil, to hate sin, to hate unrighteousness and work against it. No, you can could, you could leave that. Uh, we could be, I'm going to be using that quite a bit. You can keep it down. And last is blocking the image of me. I, I have to leave that to y'all camera folks. But again, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. How many Christians are still struggling to put that into practice? One thing I love about the book of Ephesians is, is it is intensely practical. Intense, intensely practical information about the church, how the church should function. Intensely practical information about how husband and wife should function. Intensely Practical information about how the employer and employee should function. Intensely practical information about how parents should function with their children. Intensely practical. And intensely practical in helping us to know our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Intensely practical about prayer. It is intensely practical. And I would dare say the Christian who wants to grow in their Christian life ought to memorize the book of Ephesians. Hello. It is that good a book. Or certainly not if the whole thing, large portions of it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ as it dwells in our hearts. Here comes some more practical illustration. Not only should you not remain angry for a long time and give the devil an opportunity because your anger is smoldering and smoldering anger has a way of being venomous and destroying persons, including yourself. He says, he, let him who steals, steal no longer. You used to thief? Well, listen, I got news for you. If you used to thief, I'm calling you to do something that is absolutely counter to that. You used to thief, now do something useful with your hands so that you could pay others back. You know, these thief is get save and still want hand out. No, 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 no. No, Christ has called you to a new way of life. Not the same old laziness shortcut to life. No, let him who steals, steal no longer. But rather he must labor. He must labor. Get to work. Performing with his own hands. The same teeth and hands. Now because he's been saved, these teeth and hands is labor for the Lord. Whatever you find for your hands to do, do it for the Lord with all of your might. 
Your hand can't be like this and no hand out. Your hand got to be like this. Hammering, doing something. You've been transformed. These hands can't be the same old lazy, good for nothing, shifting, useless hands they were before. Let him who steals, steal no longer. But let him labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with those who have need. This, this thing getting reverse. You was like this all the time. Now, my friend, you're like this. Here, yeah, hold on to that. Lord gave me the ability to do some work. I'm using the rest of my life to, to honor him and bless others with what he gives me. Be angry, don't sin in your anger. Use the teeth, don't teeth no more, and start, and start working for the Lord properly. And whereas you got something from somebody, start giving. Got it? This is a, folks, a Christian life is a transformed life. You can't be the same old person. Same old miserable person before you got saved. Same old grudgeful person before you got saved. No, you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind. I put it to you, if someone has not been transformed, ain't no mind been renewed. I talk to I? They answered me. <laughs> now he moves to the mouth. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Oh, the Christians would learn this. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. Sometimes you don't need to say that now. You ain't going to say that now. It's, it's, it's meat and right for this moment. Let no unwholesome, let no unwholesome word proceed forth from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, for the building up of other persons, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Friends, some people need a word of grace, not a word of condemnation. Yeah, see now, you know what will happen, right? Hmm? See, that, that, now I tell you what will happen. They don't need no lecture right now. They need grace. They need grace. Conscience beating them up already. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. My gosh, the Holy Spirit has chosen to live with sinful humanity. And in all of his holiness, he wraps you about and seals you for the day of redemption. He loves you despite the fact that you're so unlovable and you won't go and grieve him. Come, Holy Spirit, let's go to the dance. I want to shake up my leg and see who I could, I could. Yeah, well, you know, you, you could say, I, I, I supposed to love that person, but I ain't going to love them. And we grieve him by our attitudes, by our niggerly ways. Now, that, that, that's not black. You know, you, those of you who grew up of a certain age, niggerly ain't black. It's an attitude and a disposition. All right? Niggardly, break it down for those of you, those of you who don't hear well. Let all bitterness, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Those things as be in the church. <sighs> Bitter, bitterness is be in the church. Wrath is being a judge. Anger, clamor, slant <gasps> in the church. Malice in the church. Shame on us. Shame on us. Shame, 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 shame. Paul says, let all bitterness. If anyone had reason to be bitter, it's Jesus Christ hanging on Calvary's cross. Well, I'll be John Brown. You mean I left heaven itself for these wretches. These wretches who, as I go to die for them, they reject me. Say, away with this man. We have no king but Caesar. Liars. Can't stand Caesar. Just to show the contempt for Jesus. We have no king but Caesar. Away with this man. Crucify him. See Jesus coming. I can spit on him. Watch, watch. I can pluck out his beard. 
If anyone has cause to be angry, angry, bitter, to have malice, you'd think the Son of God would leave his holiness and become that way. But no, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Brothers and sisters, I put it to you that you can let the bitter, the anger, the clamor, the malice aside. Because very often, folks have no idea what they're doing to the cause of Christ, to you, to whatever. Let it go. For Christ's sake, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Release it. Release it. All bitterness, not some. All, all clamor, all raging, all slander. Let it go. The malice, let it go. Instead, we're told to be kind to one another. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. That's where it all breaks down, you know. You think you deserve to get saved because you was good. And so you don't feel no obligation to forgive nobody else. God had to save you. You ain't bad like them. You, you ain't no bad sinner. You know what I mean, Obi? You know the bad sinner and good sinner, right? You ain't no bad sinner. So you don't feel an obligation to forgive people who sin big against you. Because God saved you because you was a no bad sinner. Boy, I wish, I wish you all were hearing me today, but anyway. You see, folks, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not even one. We have all become unclean. Ain't no good sinner, bad sinner, nonsense. You are guilty, hell-bound, condemned, not able to save yourself, and you are going to bust hell right open for all of your good sinness. And so you need to forgive because you have been forgiven. That's just the way it is. He moves to chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God. I told you. No deceit found in the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. No anger, no bitter, no slander. Not found in his mouth. We are to be imitators of God. As beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for you, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Folks, when you slide into any occasion, they could say, thank you, Jesus, so and so here. Why? Yet you smell good. You smell good spiritually. You know wherever this person go, good things are there because they're so kind-hearted. They're so Christ-like. And we are to represent Christ in all that we do. But you know what the refrain is, refrain is now, eh? Yeah, yeah, here comes Mr. Christian. Yeah, we can see right now how Christian he is. Yes, sir. You understand me? It's not this. It's not this. This is not what we see. We see those who the sinner man is skeptical enjoys a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul says, no, 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 no. We are to walk just as Christ walked. We are to love just as he loved and gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Let your life be a fragrant aroma of the goodness of God, of the virtues of Christ spread abroad as you move about. But Immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you. Must not even be named among you. As is proper among saints. You know, I, I continue, the, the longer I pass, the more I realize we don't get it. We think that the Christian is just called to be a nicer sinner. He's nicer than the sinner. Just a little bit nicer than the sister. He's got an edge over the other sinner, sorry. Just a slight edge over the other sinner. And he's not as cruel. He's not as, uh, she's not as malicious. She's nicer than the sinner. No, friends. No, we are as different from chalk is to cheese. Why? Because we're called to be like Christ. And it starts with a putting aside and a transformation and a putting on. This ain't something you could do on the side. It's who you are. Amen. 
must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. We cannot look the same. Because that's why Christ's wrath came. So why? how do we look the same? How are we the same? No way! We lay aside the falsehood. We lay aside the old life of sin. We have our minds transformed. And we put on the righteousness of Christ. And we live it out. It is an intensely practical faith. There's nothing impractical about a Christian life. When a man is tra when a man is in a broken home and he's saved, everybody benefits. Because that brokenness, the cycle of brokenness that may have gone from one generation to the next to the next can now be fixed. Why? Because someone is trusting Christ to transform their life, and if their life is transformed, that cycle can get broken. And righteousness can flow to all aspects of that family. It has to happen. That's why Christ has called us. That's why Christ has saved us. We're told, therefore, not to be partakers with them, for they were formerly, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate, believers. Do not participate. Say it with me. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Unfruitful, unfruitful, unfruitful. Unfruitful. 19 years of fruitful marriage with my wife. How stupid! Would I be to believe there's some woman anywhere, anywhere, that could benefit me to have a relationship with her? Unfruitful! It cannot work! It cannot work! It will bear a bitter fruit to my family! A bitter fruit! It is not worth it! So many Christians work themselves out of a blessing! You already have the blessing of God and you work yourself out of it. No, don't participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. You live a decidedly different life. That's not who you are. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. We're called to live a totally other than life. The old things of this world have no power over you. That is, it has been broken. But some of us still nourish and we cherish the old sin life. Oh boy, I remember when I used to, and we glory in what sin used to feel like. Now you're already halfway to destruction. Because you're cherishing something that sent Christ to the cross. Can you imagine me cherishing the knife that killed my brother? Yeah, boy, you know, this is a nice knife. Boy, it's good weight. Look at this. Look, when I throw it, it always lands point first. But this knife killed my brother. Why cherish sin that took Christ to Calvary's cross? Sin is not to be cherished. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. I have a bunch of jack leg. Christian commentators telling me, well, well, why are you getting involved? All you need to do is just be involved in church. I say, what? The Bible calls us to be salt and light. The Bible tells us we must defend the cause of the widow and the, and the, and the orphan. The Bible says to fight against the yoke of injustice. Fight against it. Tell me to sit on the sidelines and just mind church. How dare you? Nonsense. Nonsense. Rather expose them. Expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. If you all only know the true state of Nassau Bahamas, you would die from shock. Wickedness that goes on in this country. 
But all things become visible when they're exposed to the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper. And I say to you, wake up, believers. And arise from the dead. See the battle. See what we're up against. And Christ will shine in you, on you. Do something about it. Do something about it. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Now, those of you that listen to me know I come to this text all the time. All the time. You go back, check my messages. I must be touched on this 10, 15, 20 times as a pastor. Therefore, be careful how you walk. I don't know why that's not a life verse for me. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of your time or days. Because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all the things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in fear of Christ. Church, We are called to think differently from the world. Malice, anger, wrath, bitterness, that's not us. We edify, we don't tear down. We're called to think differently, that's the first point. We're not to live our lives lost in the futility of thinking. We know who we are, we know whose we are, we know what we're called to do and be, and we're called to think the thoughts of the Lord after him and to do his good deeds after him. We're called to think differently. It must begin with a renewing of the mind. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6 says, <clears throat> And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge, the glory of God, and the face of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the non-Christian is ignorant because of his sins. The scriptures say, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. The scriptures say that their hearts are hardened to God. That is, it's callous. It says they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and so forth. Brothers and sisters, the unsaved man is dead because of his spiritual ignorance. Truth and life go together, just as belief and unbelief. The saved person cannot live like the non-Christian who does not know God and whose mind and heart is darkened. We must think the Lord's thoughts after him. We must think differently from the world. We must talk differently from the world in our speech and behavior. Jesus said to the Pharisees, these ungodly men trapped in religiosity, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. We are told to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to expose them. We're told to let no unwholesome word come out of our mouth, but only words that are good for ratification. Jesus says, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. If your heart is filled with righteousness, your speech will be as well. The word unwholesome literally means rotten. Let no rotten speech, let no corrupt, let no poisonous speech come out of your mouth. Not just foul language, not just foul language is being mentioned here, but rottenness of every kind. So we're not to, uh, we are to have our, our thinking transformed, our talk or our speech is to be transformed. We are to, another T, transact our lives differently from the world. Um, they get angry, we pray for. They get angry and retaliate in bitterness and wrong. We get angry and we use the anger to fix, not to destroy. We don't tear down with our words. We don't allow anything to destroy the walk that we have with the Lord. And finally, fourth, our toil. Our toil is different from that of the world. We do our work as unto the Lord. Stories told of a um, 
a Christian scrub woman um, who worked as a janitor in the two centuries ago, and um, uh, she was known as a Christian woman. And one day, one of the um, Blue Nose employees, uh, always hearing how she said she was a Christian, walks up to her and says, "Say, Sophia, Sophie, I understand that you're a Christian." Yes, sir, I'm a child of the king, she said. Oh, so you must be a princess, since God is your king. I sure am, she says. Well, if God is your father and you are a princess and a child of the king, do you think that it's beneath your dignity? Don't you think it's beneath your dignity to be found here in New York City scrubbing these dirty steps? Not being daunted, Sophie replied. There's no humiliation whatsoever. You see, I'm not scrubbing these steps for my boss, Mr. Brown. I'm scrubbing them for Jesus Christ, my Savior. And so, brothers and sisters, there is no, nothing that we do that is below our dignity. There's nothing we do in our work that does not in any way represent Christ. There's nothing in our toil that does not have Jesus as the, the uh, reason for why we are doing what we do. The rabbis told this particular saying, if you do not teach your son a trade, you teach him to be a thief. If you do not teach your son a trade, you teach him to be a thief. As Christians, everything we are to do, we must do it as if we were doing it directly for the Lord, for that's what we really are doing it for. I said to you uh, four things. In fact, there's five. We are to, excuse me, our thoughts should be different. We think differently from the world. Our talk is to be different from the world. Our toil or work is to be different from the Lord. Our transaction is to be different from the Lord. And finally, our treasure. We are to treasure people differently uh, than the world does. People are lost, hell-bound, and we must take time to love them, nurture them, show them the love of Christ that they might be saved. We should love people and use resources, not use people and love resources. May we as Christians learn to think, toil, transact differently so that we may treasure the people for whom Christ has died, love them that they might be saved. And it's all because we have laid aside that which is ungodly, the falsehood, the bitterness, the wrath, the clamor. We have had our thoughts transformed by the word of God that we've allowed to dwell richly in our hearts and we've put on the nature of Christ that we might make a difference for the kingdom of God. Well, our time is over. I want to have uh, a word of prayer for us as we determine yet again to continue to live our lives to the praise of his glory. If the musicians will join me up front, if they're still available, we will have a, uh, a word of prayer for you in just a moment. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we have a full day today. We, many of you plan to go to the funeral of uh, our brother Phil Kemp, the passing of his father, a sudden scenario. Uh, it was not anticipated in any way, and yet de death came quickly and snatched away a beloved father. We want to be there for him uh, in his law, support him and Sandra and the boys. And then uh, for those of you that uh, have time, you certainly want to go and, and uh, celebrate with Emmanuel Gospel Chapel as they bring on, I believe, four elders and four deacons uh, in their church. I want to be able to celebrate with them. I'd appreciate your prayer and encouragement as I would make my way there. Musicians, just give us a, a, um, a verse or two, and I will come back with a closing prayer. Let's all stand as we thank the Lord for his instruction to us. And we think about his love and think about his goodness. about his love, think about his goodness, think about his goodness. 
think about his grace that brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of God's love. Great is the measure of God's love. Think about it now. Think about it good. Take a moment to think about that love. That transforming love. That love that makes it all worthwhile. The love that went to Calvary's cross and sacrificed all that he is and all that he was for us that we might be saved. And as we think about that love, let's recognize that that love was shed for us that we might be a redeemed people. The fallen race of Adam sinful and hell-bound would be transformed to become the exalted sons of God for whom a new kingdom is being prepared a new world in which they will rule and in this age they will learn how to be the sons of God the daughters of God by becoming transformed in their thinking their hearts their minds and their practice and so let us determine afresh that we will indeed live as a redeemed sons and daughters of God, living our lives to the praise of his glory, saying no to sin, yes to righteousness. Shall we pray? Behold, Lord, we are your sheep. We are the flock for whom Christ has died. We were the fallen race of Adam, not fit for anything but to be cast aside. But so great was your love for us that you sent Christ to die and to redeem us. Christ, through whom you demonstrated your love for us, in that while we were yet deep in our sins, Christ died for us. Lord, help us to die to self, for the way of self is malice and anger and greed and sloth and anger and rage. A toxic life that destroys us and those around us. We're asking, Lord, that in these moments we would by faith lay aside the old life with all of its brokenness, its bruisedness, with all of its anger and rage. We choose by an act of faith to lay it aside. And we purpose now in our hearts and our minds to set aside Christ as Lord. We purpose in our minds that we would indeed be about getting our thoughts transformed by the indwelling Word of God. We're asking, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to put on Christ in all of his glory and the full measure of his wonders in our lives. Help us to live God, to have a change in speech, in thought, in action, in work, and in our toil. We pray and ask in Christ's name and for his glory's sake. Amen and amen. Our service is over, but your service to the Lord remains. I believe we have some light refreshments for our guests who have come to visit with us. Please come, take a few moments to sit with us as we um, share some light refreshments with you. I want to remind those of you that are going to the funeral.